foundation. One of the key pieces of knowledge that we employed during our preparation was solving, to pro was solving the problem through public deliberation to have a productive discourse with all involved parties. It is indeed one of the essential reasons why we have chosen structured listening methods to welcome all the ideas, whether they are conflicting or agreeing to construct a dialogue that can help us to comprehend the issue from all sides and have a cooperation rather than competition. Once again, thank you for taking some time and joining our session. We will now proceed with the introduction of our group members and the presentation. I will give the floor to Mercy. Hello, everyone. My name is Mercy Kotsi. I'm calling in from Cameroon, Rims uh, Education. Thank you. Happy to meet everyone. I'll pass over to Fahana. Thank you, Mercy. Hi, everyone. I'm Farhana from Bangladesh, and I'm currently studying at Brack University. Thank you. Steve, I think you can introduce yourself next. Yeah. Okay, I think whilst we're waiting for Steve to introduce themselves, I would like to introduce uh, Haruna Damba, uh, calling in from Uganda. He's a student at Makerere University, and he says he's a privilege to be part of the global gathering. And my name is Bakile Lamini. I am calling in uh, from South Africa. I'm a student at the University of Cape Town. Thank you very much. Hi. Okay. As we're waiting for Steve, I'll, I'll introduce myself. My name is Faiza Arshad. I'm joining in from Saudi Arabia and I study at IFIT University. Very happy to be here. Well, you we can go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dua Zahra Shah from the National University of Sciences and Technology in Pakistan. Um, so, Steve, let me know if you're back yet. Um, otherwise, I think we can get started with a short video that our group compiled of climate change impact stories from around the world, um, specifically from some of our members' um, communities. So Jess, if you could please go to the slide with the video on it, um, that would be great. Next slide, please. In the year 2017, I had the rare opportunity to visit my grandmother in the southwest region of Eswatini, known as Swaziland. My visit to my grandmother was after the severe droughts which had been experienced the previous year, droughts which had never been experienced in 35 years. This has shaped and continues to shape the lives of many smallholder farmers who are without insurance or savings, just like my grandmother. My name is Free Mercy Kutsi. I come from Cameroon. Over the years, my country has been experiencing variations in temperatures and rainfall, which has led to floods, droughts, insect outbreak, and a decrease in agricultural yield. I had the opportunity to talk to a cocoa farmer who said, school has been doing a lot of sensitization on climate change 
promoting the planting of trees, assisting in the fight against careless dumping of plastic waste by constructing plastic collection sites for recycling. While most homes in my community are beginning to switch to renewable energy sources like solar energy and biogas. Thank you. My name is Damba Haruna. I come from Uganda. Here, climate change is an aggregated yet a serious issue requiring urgent interventions. The country in the recent past have expressed increased adverse weather conditions. The prolonged drought in the north, landslides in the east, and rainfall and devastating floods in the central and western regions. Despite all these, many people still disregard that climate change is real, serious, and requires urgent interventions. Laws prohibiting people from degrading wetlands and forests are lying idle and ineffective. Deforestation is still practiced on a wide scale. Forest lands are being leased to investors, swamps turned into gardens, and people encroaching wetlands for development of factories, beaches, and homes are on increase. Every day I read stories where such natural disasters are destroying homesteads, sources of food, claiming innocent lives, and leaving many in a helpless state. I literally cry whenever I see tragedies happening. Uganda once had the political will to protect the environment and so did and did so with firm resolve. It is so hard to understand what happened to bring us to this low point. The inability to confront impunity in the degradation of the environment calls for actions from different players. As an institute of higher learning, Makere University is taking great strides in addressing climate changes. Recently, it unveiled solar-powered bus to provide eco-friendly commute to students and general public. Researchers at the institute are developing new ways of recycling plastics by leveraging bacteria. This is likely to reduce on the impacts the plastics have on the environment. As the student body, we have launched several campaigns to educate the public about climate changes and climate smart incentives such as plastic recycling, reusable energy, and reforestation. This next slide, please. Um, so we've just looked at some of the issues that different spaces and communities across the world face. Um, while details of causes, circumstances, and consequences differ, um, these stories are not isolated. They are systemic, um, connected with a thread of injustice that perpetually captures the vulnerable. Um, and it's not an event that occurs locally. It's a phenomenon that transcends borders and transpires globally. Next slide, please. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Steve Mongangi Munyoki from Kenya. I'm sorry I missed the introductions. My devices were giving me a really big pro problem, but I'm here. Uh, so uh, just to start, I'm going to show you guys uh, uh, three sets of images, and I'd really like to know how you feel after viewing each and every image. So you can just type like one emotion you feel, or you can react on the, you can react on the chat box, but I'll be reading out whatever is in the chat. So you just tell me what you think. So for the first image, this is an image of a young girl standing on a dried up riverbed in northern Kenya, Tulkana County, a place that's inf infamous for uh, experiencing devastating periods of drought. Uh, so the next image, on the next slide, uh, yeah, thank you. So the second image is the effect of the 2019-2020 Australian bushfire uh, season, also known as the Black Summer in uh, New South Wales, this is in Australia. And the last image, which is on the next slide, is uh, this is the aftermath of the Hurricane Matthew in the city of Jeremy in Haiti uh, in October 2016. So um, I don't know if I've gotten any responses from my first question, which was, uh, if you could just tell me like in one word, uh, what emotion you get after seeing each of these images. I'm seeing from Pfizer uh, sad. Um, let me just read them out real, real quick. Uh, Deborah said anxious. Doa said heartbroken. They're scared as well. There's pity. There's heartbreaking. Alarmed. Thank you so much, everyone, for the responses. All your responses are actually quite right. So what I'd like to reiterate is that this is a type of messaging or journalism known as doom and gloom journalism. 
Uh, so doom and gloom journalism or doom and gloom messaging is basically where an information bearer bombards their audience with um, information of impending danger. And uh, as you can tell in the next slide, um, the rationale behind this isn't exactly as malevolent as it sounds. But you know, the thing is, what most stakeholders who use this type of messaging believe is that they need to make their audience empathize with the um, the, uh, the status quo or scare them into action. So a really good example is uh, the New York Times article by David Wallace Wells known as, uh, uh, it was titled The Uninhabitable Earth. And in this article, he uses this image that you can see of a modernized uh, uh, fossil uh, to describe how we could be, uh, we could be cooked to death from both inside and out in a hotter climate. Yeah, that's quite gruesome. And despite the percentage of mainstream media that uses this messaging in climate journalism, as I reiterated in the next slide, the reality as outlined by Anthony Lezerovitz, director of Yale program on climate change communication is that this type of tone can have very different effects on people. Now see, the thing is for a really long time, many scientists have focused on the effects of climate change, but we really haven't looked at how our minds react to this news. And as we can tell from the next slide, what, my, what I'll be focusing on is the psychology of climate action. So in his book, uh, the, the author, an author known as Parapsin Stokes, a Norwegian scientist, he has a book called What We Think About When We Try Not To Think About Global Warming. He adequately outlines this catch-22 and the psychology of climate action. And in the next slide, as reiterated in the diagram, he goes on to outline five psychological barriers that block us from acting on climate change news. But for easier reference, we can, uh, we can outline three of them. And the first one is denial, the second one is displacement, and the third one is rationalism. So I'm just going to explain each and every psychological barrier uh, with, the, with the slides. So the, the first psychological barrier is denial, as uh, seen in the first slide. Now see, most people think denial is based on ignorance or a lack of intelligence, but the reality is actually quite the con contrary because when we negate or ignore and avoid to acknowledge the unsettling facts about climate change, we find refuge from fear and guilt. This makes it easier for us to get back at those whom we feel criticize our lifestyles because most people, especially in 2020, are experiencing a phenomenon known as apocalypse fatigue. And that's for denial. The second psychological barrier as outlined in the next slide is displacement. Now see, the thing is human nature is hardwired for optimism optimism. That's why when you're feeling tired or you're feeling like you've had a really long day, you just want to uh, open open uh, your laptop or open your TV and uh, switch on your laptop, switch on your TV and like watch a uh, rom-com or just a comedy movie, you know, because we're hardwired for optimism. So most of the times we tend to shut down when we constantly hear about how we are destroying the planet. And according to research by the American Psychological Association and UCLA, a number of people believe that global warming is still very distant from everyday concerns. And most people tend to believe that climate change is either distant in time, in that our descendants are the ones who are going to feel the effects, or distant in space, which is, you know, melting glaciers or polar bears and volcanoes far, far away. So that, that's for displacement. And the next uh, slide is rationalism. Now, see, rationalism is actually quite interesting because most of the times, if what we know conflicts with what we do, then cognitive dissonance sets in. And I'll, I'd just like to give an example. Um, from the country that I come from, which is Kenya, most of the times um, eating beef is, see, is seen as like a luxury, you know. But if you try and explain to someone that the fact that your consumption of beef is actually contributing to um, global warming through the increased fossil energy use, then most of the time cognitive dissonance will set in because we try to set our minds, uh, we try to make sure that we don't set our minds into a state of conflict. So we therefore rationalize the facts by looking for information that confirms our exi existing values and notions and filtering away what challenges them. This is because most of the times our identity tends to override the facts. Now, as we can tell from the next slide, how we communicate climate change is actually quite flawed. And uh, this is definitely clear from the analysis that we, because we tend, we need to bring 
in a more human-centric approach to communicating climate change. And this can be done by broadening the conversation and including the psychology of climate action. Because most people don't form their opinions on this matter of the news, but from people they, they can relate to and the community around them. And uh, the recommendations, as we outline in the next slide, from just this, um, the analysis that we've done is that first of all, we should en be encouraging individual solutions and building a bottom-up approach to climate action. As, and the second is focusing on the stories of victims of climate change who come up with empowering ways to better the situation. But I'd like us to focus more on the first point, which is encouraging individuals to uh, individual solutions and building a bottom-up approach. Now, see, we can do this through something very interesting known as deliberative democracy. So deliberative democracy, as outlined in the next slide, is basically where we bring together accurately informed individuals from different backgrounds to engage in a substantive balance of arguments that eventually leads to a consensual outcome. Um, and this consensual outcome is used by policymakers to create more citizen-centric policies. Now, as, as how we act as social citizen is as social citizens is really important because, as we said before, um, most people don't really get the, the memo from the news. They look at the communities around them. So if we can come up with a model of democracy where each and every person's opinion is viewed equally and put into action, then that's what's going to steer the conversation into something different. And um, as we can see on the, in the next slide, uh, one of the biggest proponents, or rather a good example of an institution or a foundation that uses deliberative democracy is the Kettering Foundation. Now, <clears throat> now the Kettering Foundation does this annually by having a deliberative democracy um, institute that brings together various global stakeholders from across all fields to explore ideas that can improve public life at the community level through democratic practices. But for us to, and this year's exchange um, actually was focused on climate choices and how we should meet the challenges of a warming planet. And you know, through this type of exchange, exchanges, people like me with barely any experience get to sit down with industry, key industry players such as Derek Barker and Sir Bear Williams to talk about climate choices. And there were a couple of various options that we talked about. The first one was sharply reducing carbon emissions. Uh, the second one was preparing and protecting our communities. And the third one was accelerating innovation. Uh, but before we can set in how deliberative democracy works, um, I'd like us to look at Fishkin's model of deliberation as seen in the next slide. Now, Fishkin's model of deliberation is actually quite simple uh, because Fishkin believed that deliberative democracy or rather de a deliberative discussion should be informed. It should be balanced. It should be substantive. It should be conscientious and it should be comprehensive. But I'd like us to focus on the more practical aspect, which is the second characteristic, which uh, is basically saying that the deliberative discussions should be balanced. Now, in the next slide, there's a Venn diagram. Um, and from this Venn diagram, we can deduce that there's three important stakeholders when it comes to deliberative democracy. And the first stakeholder is citizens. The second stakeholder uh, is members of uh, members of the community or just the community in general. And the third stakeholder is institutions. Now, if we focus a bit more on the last stakeholder, which is institutions, institutions basically have governments and campuses or universities. And it's important to note that universities have a very important role to play in facilitating a more inclusive approach to climate change discourse through holding frequent deliberative democracy exchanges. And this is because they have the ability to actively engage each and every stakeholder uh, that's been named above. Now, in conclusion, um, I strongly believe that we need to focus climate change discourse on empowerment and optimism instead of fear, guilt and shame, because our, brand, our brains are more receptive than we think, and they're actually more powerful than we think. And there's a quote that uh, perhaps in Stokes had said, uh, which is outlined in the next slide. Uh, he basically said that the biggest obstacle to dealing with climate disruption lies between your ears. And just as we discussed before, um, if we can try our best to steer this conversation into something more empowering, then this will basically change how we've been dealing with this uh, issue. 
so I, I think before we can talk a bit more about uh, like the role universities play in uh, climate injustice or ad addressing climate injustice, I think it would be better if Farhana tells us a bit more about climate perceptions. Thank you so much, Steve. Hi, everyone. Unfortunately, my connection is not very stable today, so I'll have to keep my video off. Okay, uh, so picking up from where Steve left off, the biggest obstacle to dealing with climate disruption indeed lies between our ears. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So for us to effectively address climate disruption, it is important that relevant stakeholders understand the gravity of what we are dealing with. In view of that, we now bring forward the perspectives on climate change of various stakeholders to get a sense of where we are right now and how much work there is still left to be done. Next slide, please. Unfortunately for us, there is no planet B which makes it imperative for us to understand and internalize what climate change, what climate change entails and the risk it, it, it manifests. Next slide. How we perceive the risks of climate change is based on five factors. The first one being extent of factual knowledge or data. If we don't understand what climate change is, how it's affecting us and how it's impacting our future, it won't be possible for us to encapsulate its urgency. How we perceive the risk is to a great extent molded by what knowledge or data we have access to. But we must also ensure that whatever information we have access to is data-driven and authentic. Secondly, the level of personal threat. So as Steve mentioned, unless we spend time with the communities affected by climate change, we won't be able to grasp it fully. So uh, say I know about some country somewhere which might get swallowed up because of rising sea levels as a result of climate change. But knowing that might not be enough for me to feel the risk of climate change because my country will not go underwater and I'm not being affected. Well, actually my country might go underwater because it ranks sixth on the global climate risk index. Okay, so uh, moving on. Thirdly, extent to which person or community is open to changing ideas. So uh, there are some of us who are not willing to have our beliefs challenged and we like to stick to what we believe in. Uh, we tend to suffer from a bias in this case. So often we might not see the risks because we are not open to having our challenge ideas being challenged. Fourth, extent to which the risk can be controlled. Again, drawing from what Steve had mentioned, we tend to shut down when we think that we are destroying the planet. So when the narrative that the risk is beyond our control is pushed, we psychologically react by being indifferent to it because we think there's nothing we can do. Fifth, immediacy of the risk. If I believe that climate change will not affect me or my family in the near future, but it might affect the world, say, 100 years from now, I might not be too concerned about it or consider it immediate. Next slide. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so for a phenomenon as all encompassing as climate change, Understanding and building constructive public opinion is key. Public opinion on climate change is the aggregate of attitude or belief concerning science, economics, and politics of climate change. And with so many factors involved, it's actually more complicated than we might imagine. And the media also has an, has an important role to play in shaping it. Public opinion is dynamic, changing over time due to personal, social, political, economic, and environmental factors. This presents us with the opportunity to leverage the public to mobilize efforts in favor of mitigating climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, 
The People's Climate Voice is the world's largest survey of public opinion on climate change, covering around 56% of the world's population. In 2020, their survey found that 64% of people believe climate change is a global emergency, despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which presents a clear and convincing mandate for decision makers to increase their ambition levels in commitment under the uh, Paris Agreement. So as we can see from the graph, uh, we can see the results in terms of country groups. And as you can see, surprisingly, only 58% of LDCs, least developed countries, who are likely to be the most impacted by climate change, believe it to be. son los más afectados por el cambio climático, de hecho, consideran que estamos ante una emergencia. So here we can see the same results, but this time in terms of regions. Next slide, please. So what do people believe to be the causes of climate change? Yale's Climate Connection Survey conducted in 33 countries gave the results that you can see on the screen. And from the results, as you can see, majority of the people believe that climate change to have been caused by humans. Next slide, please. When it comes to something like climate change, which warrants our immediate attention, just understanding the urgency is not enough. People also need to have the desire for comprehensive and urgent action. People's Climate Voice showed that 59% of people thought that we have to do everything necessary and we have to do it urgently. This shows that all the climate change movements that we have been seeing around have been successful and have been able to create awareness and strike a chord with the people. Next slide, please. But unfortunately, the picture is not as rosy as we would want it to be. There's still a very large number of people who believe that climate change is not real and humans are not responsible for it. Indonesia and US have the highest shares of climate change deniers, followed by Saudi Arabia and Egypt, who are reliant on fossil fuels for exports. So one country which stands out in this list is India, uh, which is a notable example of how fake news and conspiracy theories can distort people's perception. Next slide, please. Can we move to the next slide? It can, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so uh, the, uh, the perception of politicians and global leaders who are in a position of power is also imperative because they're the ones mobilizing resources and pushing forward this agenda. So while we have leaders like former US President Donald Trump, President of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who showed a blatant disregard for climate change, fortunately, now we have strong voices advocating for climate change. Next slide. Former US President Barack Obama mentioned that climate change is not a far off problem, but it's happening right here, right now, reiterating its emergency. Next slide. Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General of the United Nations, emphasize that we must take steps right now to lessen the impact of climate change. Next slide, please. While Al Gore, chairman and co-founder of Generation Investment Management, urged people to stop financing denials of climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does the scientific community think of climate change? That's also something very important for us to understand. Can we move to the next slide, please?
90 to 100 percent of publishing climate scientists agree that global surface temperatures have increased in recent decades and that the trend is caused mainly by human induced emissions of greenhouse gases. And as of now, no scientific body of national or international standing disagrees with this view. In fact, consensus has further developed that some form of action should be taken to protect people against the impacts of climate change. National science ac academies have also called on world leaders to cut global emissions. Next slide, please. The scientific community are also faced with certain challenges as they have to compete with disinformation and misinformation circulated by non-scientific outlets and interest groups. Additionally, there is a dominant perception of the public and policymakers that scientists tend to exaggerate the effects of climate change which is also something the scientists have to tackle. Next slide, please. Okay, so last but definitely not the least, not the least <clears throat> what is your perception of climate change? We really want to hear from you. So let us know in the chat and thank you so much for listening. Now over to you. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so as you guys write in your chat, um, the different perspectives that you have, we've just looked at multiple perspectives that different people and kinds of people hold. Um, scientists, politicians, and the public, um, they all look at climate change through different lenses. So how do we harmonize diverse angles without subduing voices to reach actions, solutions, and choices that will move us towards a better world? There is no straight answer, no magic, no map to get us to a conclusive destination. But we can make the mindful and conscious choice of listening. Next slide, please. But not just any listening. What I will now share with you all is a framework we refer to as structured listening. While you may have experienced listening to a grieving loved one or listening to a speech by someone you admire, Structured listening can be more systematic and deliberate without losing a sense of versatility and adaptability. It aims to address issues and reach an enhanced understanding of, the, of at least, um, understanding at the least and concrete solutions at the most. Before I move forward, I'd like to highlight that some of the content of the following slides comes from our learnings at a session with Kettering Foundation. So shout out to them. Next slide, please. So structured listening is a mode of discussion that you can adopt at institutional, communal, or even global levels. A great example is East Belgium's Permanent Citizens Assembly and Citizens Council drawn randomly from the assembly. They provide recommendations and by law, the parliament either has to implement them or provide public justifications on not implementing those recommendations. Another instance of public deliberation was the America in One Room experiment. A sample of registered voters met and moderated small group discussions and plenary sessions with competing experts and politicians. They deliberated different issues that were important to voters in that election cycle, and they were provided a detailed briefing book of policy proposals in those areas with balanced arguments for and against each proposal. The book was prepared and vetted by policy experts from both parties and an advisory committee. By the end of the experiment, the most polarizing proposals, whether from the left or the right, generally lost support and more centrist proposals moved to the foreground. There's also an example of a professor at the University of Nairobi experimenting with classroom deliberation on the topic of national cohesion and diversity. The professor asked students to share their concerns and produced an issue guide to facilitate the discussion. He presented options using information and student assignments. Each student brought up personal examples of experiences with discrimination and favor. At the end, students noted that they had never thought that deeply about an issue before. Next slide, please. So a starting point for structured listening is to include underrepresented, vulnerable, and marginal identities based on characteristics, including but not limited to gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, disability, and age. And this inclusion shouldn't just extend to ensuring their presence, but also to actively creating a just and equitable space 
and eliminating any systemic barriers or asymmetries of power they may face and fully participating and having their voices heard. Participants not only have the liberty to speak, but also the responsibility to not necessarily agree, but listen and actively engage with what all stakeholders say. Essentially, there should be formal and substantive equality. The second requirement is access to resources well before the commencement of conversation. This ensures a relatively equal footing in terms of knowledge and context among all participants who will discuss the issue. To this end, we can provide diverse, accurate, and relevant materials, resources, and evidence. For instance, participants can be given access to competing experts who answer their questions from different points of view. Citizens can undergo training to equip themselves with skills of analyzing complex issues and presenting information in forms that others are willing and able to consume. Structured listening can and should materialize in different formats. This can be beneficial because each participant is most comfortable with a different mode of discussion. By encompassing all or most modes, everyone will have an equal opportunity to speak up how they want to. Formats can include small group and plenary discussions, activities, and games. There can be a neutral moderator to facilitate the conversation, manage conflict, temper power dynamics, and encourage opinions from everyone. Communication can be verbal or visual, written or spoken, reasoned or passionate. It can be a song or a story. It can be all of these things. Next slide, please. Now we come to the method that structured listening can follow. During the discussion, it's important to weigh multiple perspectives, give everyone an opportunity to speak, and gather all concerns. Special consideration should be given to facts and values to ensure that understanding is holistic and informed by realities and what people live by and attach most meaning to. After group communication is over, a certain time should be allocated to allow individual learning and reflection. Participants can come to terms with what they've listened to without the ebb and flow of exchange overwhelming them. Finally, although the importance of reaching an understanding and connection cannot be understated, there should be an effort to include an applied component addressing how best to move forward. In line with this, possible actions and their tensions and trade-offs can be grouped together before developing detailed and actionable recommendations. At the end of each session, detailed feedback should be taken from each participant on the conduct of the session and how it can be made more inclusive and effective in the future. Next slide, please. Structured listening can strive to embody some characteristics highlighted in deliberative democracy models. So we talked about the James Fishkin model that mentions substantive balance, diversity, conscientiousness, and equal consideration. Furthermore, Amy Gutman and Dennis F. Thompson have a model which tells us that structured listening can also be reciprocal, as in reasons should be acceptable to free and equal persons seeking fair terms of cooperation, accessible, as in the reasons must be given in public and the content must be understandable to the relevant audience, binding, as in the reason giving process leads to a decision that is enforced for some period of time and deliberation isn't just for the sake of deliberation. Dynamic or provisional, as in the participants must keep open the possibility of changing their minds and continuing a reason giving dialogue that can challenge previous decisions. Next slide, please. Essentially, there should be a practice of mutual respect extended to all, effort to ensure a safe, welcoming space and mutual recognition of the legitimacy of different values, preferences, judgments, and discourses. Structured listening should emphasize constructive exchange and keeping a non-adversarial tone. This isn't a debate or an argument with winners and losers and polarized sides. We are seeking a collectively enhanced understanding of the issue, its nuances and complexities and potential ways forward. Next slide, please. Structured listening methods carry long-term and widespread benefits for citizens, decisions, and structures. Citizens are found to become more empathetic, creative, generous, self-aware, better able to formulate opinions and justify them with reason, and more likely to recognize the moral merit of opponents' claims. There's an increase in public spirit and engagement, thought sophistication, willingness to compromise for the common good, and empowerment, including those with the least. Citizens become more willing to work with those with different in interests and values, exchange knowledge and experiences, and discover solutions. 
Outcomes and decisions are more grounded in holistic knowledge, evidence, arguments, and understanding, and are considered more generous, informed, and morally superior. They are less partisan and polar, reflect a more equitable consideration of interests, and are less likely to infringe on rights. People attach more legitimacy to and are more likely to trust such policies, making them more sustainable. Society as a whole is positively impacted as public debate is ignited and people are pushed to revise their perspectives. In turn, this can lead to a more nuanced and less polarized position. Next slide, please. Now that we've talked about how structured listening works, how do we implement this framework to deliberate global issues and choices? Again, a question with no straight answer. But we learn best by practical example, which is why we now invite you to join us in a discussion moderated by Mercy on the contentious and critical topic of climate choices. Thank you very much, Dua. Thanks to all of you who've just pre presented to us the slides. We're going to go now to the panel discussion and it is open to everybody. You can come in with your opinions. If you have a question, you drop it in the chat box and it's going to be read out for everyone to hear and we give you a response. And Mercy once more moderating this panel and joining me on this panel is Bakile, John, Steve, Dua, and Haruna. Haruna will be dropping his comments in the chat box because he has a hearing impediment and we're going to be reading it out for everyone to hear. So we're going to move right away to the panel. And our first question goes thus, what is the role of universities in climate change action and the promotion of sustainable development? So John, can you tell us what you think is the role of universities? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question and thank you for the presenting this uh, immense amount of information. It was very useful again to recap, uh, even though I'm a part of the group. Uh, um, I hope that the, the people are enjoying our, our presentation. So the question is very important. Since we are all coming from different parts of the world and we are all students and we have been studying for many, many years. Some of us have already second, third degrees. Uh, <clears throat> so the universities actually play uh, immense. It, it's a university has been known as a place, as a hub for knowledge and the wisdom. So it's, it's from the beginnings, uh, from centuries old tradition and a place for the search of search for truth and reason. Um, but as we reflect back, it, uh, it was only within the walls of this university, within those uh, campus buildings. So we go there and we learn and uh, it stays within us and it doesn't go beyond the, the campus walls. We are now uh, living in an interdependent world uh, where there is a need to connect. Uh, with the outer world to develop and keep the progress. So university need to tackle this issue uh, and go out to take this knowledge out into the practice to the communities that surround them. So for example, if, um, if my university is uh, surrounded with a community which is not developed, uh, there, there's a big need, a practical need uh, to employ the theory which is learned, obtained in the university and in, employ it in a practical world in those communities. Um, for example, now I learned something about um, SDGs or climate change or recycling. I will go to that community where I come from and practice it. I employ that theoretical knowledge in practice. So universities should, pl uh, should play a key role in building dialogues with stakeholders uh, and uh, such as factories, farmers, who are involved with production of, of uh, with production on daily basis, uh, and listen their thoughts. I would say, um, because listening is a key, uh, and collaboration is a key. And uh, together with these stakeholders, um, plan a um, plan a towards the reduction of carbon emission, carbon footprint, and pollution. And as a result, in general, universities can play the role of forum uh, where every, every site can come and discuss whether it's 
uh, as I said in the beginning, whether it's conflicting or agreeing, um, at the end, we will have a, a dialogue that can move us to the next step. Thank you. Thank you, John. Education is actually the key to getting all this information to all. So, Bakile, what is your take to this? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mercy. Uh, just to, to link what uh, John has shared, John mentioned something quite important about education. And I personally believe that uh, universities are critical, very critical institutions in supporting and delivering national and global environmental objectives. Um, so in, in that essence, I think the best way universities can or should approach it is to rethink how we do our research. So in terms of our research, making sure that it's very interdisciplinary, it's very transdisciplinary and very much embedded in, in, in our communities. And this is one of the conversations that we had um, here at the University of Pretoria when I arrived uh, yesterday was around how do we make sure that our research does respond to the everyday realities of, of, of communities. And the reason for that is because you cannot separate separate climate change from um, the other social issues. When you look at a socio-ecological model, you can't separate climate change from inequality, from poverty, from unemployment, and all these other uh, socio-economic uh, you know, challenges that, that, that we are facing. Because the truth of the matter is, folks who are in um, you know, disadvantaged um, contexts, especially low-middle-income countries uh, who are, you know, suffering or who are a result of um, whether it's racial segregation, whether it's whatever um, exclusion, they suffer disproportionately uh, and they are impacted disproportionately from, uh, from climate change. So I think what is quite important is for our universities to rethink um, how we do research, making sure that our research does answer the relevant questions that are faced in our everyday communities. And I think most important, Importantly, within uh, low middle income countries, uh, because the challenges that are faced this side of the world might not be um, the same as challenges that are faced in, in, in you know, in, 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 developed, in the developed world. So I think it's just a matter of changing the strategy, making sure that we ask questions that are relevant to the everyday realities, but even more important, making sure that these are questions that, or rather these are answers and research products that, um, you know, are very implementable when it comes to uh, policy making and policy processes. So I think the way we do research should be very much embedded in communities and should answer to the everyday realities of, 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 of society. Thank you, Messi. Thank you. Thank you very much. But here, education should be very strategic, so we capture the exact points. I'm going to go over to Haruna Damba, who says, just to recall Dr. Hawke's remarks in the previous session, he said, the role of universities go beyond knowledge, production, and therefore are critical in addressing climate change. On the context, I agree with him, given the social, political and economic roots of the crisis and the need to engage with professional development, civic action and public awareness. Therefore, universities should go beyond teaching to providing solutions to these issues. For example, putting more focus on green innovations. With this, I'm going to open up to Steve. Steve, what is your take on the role of universities? Thank you very much, Masi, and thank you everyone who's given the points, uh, the very well-informed points. Uh, so I'm just going to give two very brief points. And the first one, I believe, is that I think that universities should come in to accelerate innovation. And this is through the support that they can give to the innovators, because it's quite important, uh, since they are one of the most important stakeholders when it comes to uh, this point. And I'd just like to give an example of Nzambi Mute from Kenya, who turned plastic waste into bricks, bricks that are stronger than concrete. And this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for collaboration, uh, just engagement and collaboration. So that's, that's my first point. And my second point is basically uh, universities should come together, should make sure that they bring together every stakeholder 
And when we talk about stakeholders, most of the times the focus is on lecturers and the civil society. But I think students should also be brought forward and should be put uh, uh, to the table so that we can all discuss what we think. Because I'll, I'll give you an example or a rather personal example. Um, so one time in my class, um, I, I used to be taught by my juris, in my jurisprudence class, I used to be taught by the former attorney general known as Gidho Mwigai. And Gidho Mwigai was attorney general at the time when Kenya was going through a lot of things just in justice and law, because he was attorney general at the time when the presidential election results were contested by the Supreme Court. And during class, during our jurisprudence class, he literally asked us what we, if we were in the Supreme Court, or if we were justices in the Supreme Court, in, in the Supreme Court, what would we have done? And the thing is, by bringing us to the table and actually letting us um, have our opinion and listening to our opinion, then there's a, a type of innovation that's brought out in us, you know. And that's just basically what university should do, even in this climate justice issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. From everything we've all said, education is actually the key. If you educate one person, you edu educate the world. So university programs should be so inclusive such that climate change should probably come at every section of the program. So that students grow with the mindset of the climate is changing and what is it we have to do? What innovation should we be thinking and coming up with? And if this knowledge is gained by us in school, what is the next step to do? Don't stay with it. Let's share the knowledge because there are a lot of people out there. They, they just know something is happening. The climate is changing. But what is causing it? Like a lady told me when I asked her, like, Ma, do you know about climate change? And she told me, do you, do you know why there is too much sun? Now? And she told me, they say it's climate change. I don't know what it's all about. So people know, but they don't have those details. Lifestyle is not transformed because the knowledge we have we have not been doing enough by sharing. So if you have the knowledge, educate these people, educate your community. And I think education will really go a long way to ameliorating the problem of climate change. Thank you guys so much. So I'm going to still ask you, do you think countries have a role to play in the fight against this climate change? I'll go to Bakile. Bakile, what's your take to this? Uh, thank you so much, Messi. Um, that's a very good question, actually, especially when you say countries, just, you know, every country. So I come from a very small country, 1.1 million uh, people. And, you know, the carbon footprint of the country is very tiny. Um, you know, in, in comparison with other uh, big countries, especially uh, from the West. So I think what, what, what is required is, you know, for, I would say the developing countries should perhaps think twice about how they approach, especially with, with green economy. And I know that there is a lot that, that, that is being done, but I think there is a lot that is also not um, being done. And then in terms of uh, being in a middle income country, low middle income country, is how do we make sure that our economies are very resilient and make sure that our economies are green so that um, when we, we, we move towards being uh, quote and quote, um, you know, stimulating our economies, our economies don't, you know, create the problems that we, we, we currently see. So I think there is a role that um, the developed world needs to do and the global south needs to do, but it's all about, I think, changing um, how our, econo our economies are run, making sure that, um, you know, we, we, we adopt more uh, into, into, into green economies and most importantly, making sure that our economies are very much resilient because currently our economies, especially in the global south, are, are very vulnerable uh, because of, of climate change. And again, it, 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 it's, it's a problem that is you know, created somewhere else, but it disproportionately affects and impacts people who have no idea and, and, and have no control over it. So I think it's just a matter of making sure that we rethink how we do uh, our, our, our economies um, in this side of the world. Thank you, Bakile. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Dua. Dua, what's your take to the fact that to countries handling climate change? 
Thanks, Marcy. So um, I'm going to, uh, uh, first of all, I think it's essential to explore how historically developed countries have produced the most carbon emissions. And now that developing countries are trying to advance economically, it's important for developed countries to take a lot of responsibility um, and extend support to developing countries so that they can grow quickly, but also sustainably. Um, but talking specifically about potential solutions, and I'm going to draw something um, from what Bukila said as well. So uh, I'm going to focus on what works for developing countries because a lot of what works in wealthier states won't work in the global south because of resource and capacity limitations. Um, but I think what's really important here is ensuring that any adopted solutions are multidimensional and they tackle multiple issues simultaneously. Um, and any policy that's implemented uh, should be sensitive to and target vulnerable populations like women, children, and minorities um, who often don't get to benefit from development programs fully. Um, and further, ensure that solutions are informed by the voices of those most uh, disproportionately impacted. Um, so going with this line of thought, I think one strategy is eliminating the digital divide. Um, by providing, uh, for instance, even smartphones or tablets, because it will not only expand employment and educational opportunities for low-income groups, uh, thereby working to alleviate poverty and unemployment, but it will also provide an additional avenue for them to become aware of the issue of climate change. Um, then, of course, education is crucial with a specific focus on schooling for girls. Um, so again, not only will this allow them to become better off in the long run, but it will also provide an opportunity for them to learn about climate issues and how to tackle them. Um, and in line with this, I think it's important to integrate training that would be relevant for them, not just in their future jobs, but also in their current lives. For instance, um, if a student is also coming from a small farming family background, um, the education that would really help them in the present day would be, um, and this could be implemented in training and workshops, uh, it would be things on climate smart agriculture, um, because this, this can open up uh, higher altitude areas for farming or enable new types of crops to be grown. Um, and to this end, you know, teaching them about crop diversification, climate proofing, green processing technologies, uh, generally sharing methods of increasing productivity of a certain area, um, keeping, you know, resources and biodiversity protected um, and promoting food security, even if they're living in a very climate stressed uh, region. And then generally, um, you know, spreading awareness about climate future projections and community based resource planning uh, will really help them plan for their future adequately. Um, and then also talking about employment specifically, there is massive potential for social protection schemes that combine environmental and social objectives within a participatory framework. Um, so for instance, encouraging sustainable ecotourism and providing incentives like financial incentives for local communities to protect natural resources and deliver environmental services. Um, all of this will effectively contribute to protecting people while protecting the planet. Um, and then talking about mobility, because this is an issue that I see a lot in, uh, in Pakistan as well. Um, so obviously, eco-friendliest transport modes would be walking or riding uh, a bike or taking public transport. Um, but often vulnerable populations in developing countries can't actually do this because of issues of safety. Um, so working on making these options more inclusive, uh, making public transport safer, making areas more walkable and bikeable. Um, and of course, this would not just be better for the planet, but it will also allow um, women and minorities to travel a lot more independently. Um, and, and the last point that I wanted to discuss about this is that it's really important to train and mobilize local communities to actually deal with disasters. So spreading information and sending out early warnings um, through uh, local methods like phone, radio, text, and community events, and making sure that they're in local languages. Um, and in the context of disasters, it's vital to provide security, um, shelter, access to necessities, and counseling, especially for women and children climate migrants who are at the highest risk of disease, trauma, and violence uh, during climate migration. Dua, thank you very much, Dua. That was a great one. John, what's your, what's your take to this? Yeah, um, I totally agree with the ideas that have been uh, mentioned by my colleagues. And also in the chat, I see some activity going on. Please feel free, guys, uh, to include your uh, opinions about this topic. So uh, on my take on this um, issue of what's the role of countries 
in combating climate change or responding climate change, let's say. Uh, so the, one of the reasons that we have a climate change is a, is a rapid, rapid increase of globalization. Um, uh, the recently I have been reading uh, an article about deglobalization uh, from switching from globalization to localization as uh, Dua was mentioning about uh, lo uh, improving local communities. So uh, what, 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 we, what we mean by deglobalization, I think uh, one way to um, reduce the carbon footprint is flying less um, because like planes, uh, they, and then the consumerism, the increased consumerism in countries, well, since we are interdependent, uh, now we, it's really hard for us uh, to, to focus on locals. But it, it is really essential if we want to have a green economy and if you want to have a, a safe environment. So uh, I would suggest that the countries, indeed, they have a very important role, especially focusing, especially uh, if we take one country, um, ruling elite, um, they have a final say, of course. Uh, but like we have to, uh, in some countries, we have to force our uh, young uh, leaders, uh, young generation for uh, university students to take action on this, to impose and to fight for their rights, uh, to do uh, meetings, organize meetings, uh, to make, the, to make the, the direction of decision to change into green because the, we are the uh, people, we are the young generation who will be living in the future, not uh, the, those people necessarily in the uh, power. Um, so the, we have to enforce, uh, there should be enforcement of policies on climate change that, will be, that should be prioritized. And I think um, that way we have a significant uh, chances to reduce um, carbon emission. Okay, thank you very much, John. I'm just going to go right to the chat and read Haruna's comments. Haruna says, in my opinion, I think multilateral collaborations between countries are imperative in addressing such a contentious issue as climate change. Interventions may include enacting new policies, collaborative research between universities and financing community-based projects, especially those addressing the issues, for example, like issues indicated to us, the project turning plastic bottles into bricks by Steve. So Steve, what's your take to this, what to the, to the things countries should be doing to fight climate change? Uh, thank you, Mercy. First of all, I feel like uh, my colleagues have basically um, addressed almost everything I was going to say. So I'm just going to try my best to keep it short. Um, I think the first thing that countries should focus on is sharply reducing carbon emissions. And as you can tell, or rather what Doha had said, um, what works for one country can work for the next. So I think that's that's what one of the things that countries should put into thought because every country has different per capita carbon two emissions. And this should be one of the things that they should use in their assessments to uh, make better informed decisions and better informed policies. And I'd just like to give an example of what's happening here locally. Um, my colleagues know most of the times I really complain about the things that my government does. But one thing that I do support, or rather one thing that I do support, uh, one thing I like is, is the burning of plastic paper bags. And I really supported that because most of the time uh, uh, that decision was really contested. So we thought it wouldn't happen. But you can tell now that the parks and just basically everywhere else is looking much cleaner. So that's the first point. And I think my second point would basically be, as Dua had said, I'm just going to re reiterate this point, uh, to prepare and protect our communities. So when you talk about protecting our communities, we're already addressing the fact that climate change in most places has already gone past the, uh, the, the place of uh, no return, in, in other words. So, you know, the thing is, the most vulnerable are the ones who are mostly affected. And what we need to understand is that climate change isn't just an environmental problem, but it's also a social issue and it's a political issue. So uh, the most vulnerable in the society are the ones that we should be looking at the most, you know, the, the people with disabilities, the sick and basically just the poor. And um, this can basically be done through support 
from the government and care and just basically doing um, adequate risk assessments uh, so that we can prevent this uh, this um, vulnerable groups from being uh, greatly affected. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Countries should really pre prepare and protect their communities. I think local, local governments like councils should also help the community to implement policies that are laid in place by the government. For example, there are some areas where people live and it's a risky area for them. And we know the rainy season is coming. We know the wet season, when it comes, rivers overflow and so on. We lose lives. All the years, what is happening? As a country, as a council in that country, you are supposed to prepare your environment. You are supposed to protect your people by making sure they are safe before time, such that you don't have to be working with the effects of the climate change. You plan for it before it gets to you. So I think if all countries look at it and take it personally, like all leaders take it personally, it's going to be far better for us. So we are going to go straight again, I'm going to ask you guys, what actions can individuals be taking? What is it as an individual you can do on your part to fight climate change? So I'll come back to you, John. What is it you can do? And you can tell the public as an individual, these are some of the things I do to fight climate change and you can do same. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I have been waiting for this question. Uh, uh, in an individual level, uh, what my practice is, so since we are all um, the people who are uh, making of this country, making of this institution, making of this universities, everything. Uh, I would say we are the cause of um, cause and victim of our own actions and beliefs. First of all, uh, listening should start within oneself, you know, and reflect on the issues that uh, that are happening in the world and then in our communities. If we put it into economic let's say terms, we should all need to strive to maximize our efforts on reducing carbon fish, carbon footprint. Um, there are numerous ways we can deal with it. In my personal um, uh, matters, like since we are all young, we all, of course like uh, to um, wear fashionable, be fashionable uh, and uh, have all sorts of uh, clothes and, and, uh, and necessities that are uh, not necessarily necessities. Um, but material, I, material goods, uh, for example, um, I'm trying to reduce my uh, footprint, carbon footprint through using, being a minimalistic person, let's say. Um, we need to reduce our needs. Uh, for example, um, you don't need 10 t-shirts, let's say. You don't need um, this uh, luxury Louis Vuitton or Gucci. Uh, I think uh, it, we have to really, because the fashion industry really uh, contributes a lot, uh, in my view, and uh, be, being minimalistic and uh, living minimal life that is uh, up to necessity um, is um, very crucial uh, in order to, um, to, to take actions in individual level and to be responsible uh, for, the, for the, our own actions, first of all, before discussing and before going to the wide, uh, wider um, worldwide issues. Okay, thank you very much, John. So Dua, what's your take to this? What is it individuals should be doing to fight climate change? Thanks, Mercy. So as John already mentioned, we can actually do a lot as individuals. Um, not only because we can affect change at our own level, but also because we can impact larger institutions as consumers and citizens. Um, so expanding in the first sense, recycling and reusing, uh, but also again, as John mentioned, becoming more minimalistic consumers. So um, for instance, when we're buying something, we should consider a product's durability and how eco-friendly it is. Um, and we should also obviously waste things a lot less. And um, we can make a habit of donating our possessions like books and clothes. Um, this is a huge social trend in Pakistan. Um, people are very generous with their possessions. Nothing really you know, goes to waste in that sense. Um, so I think that's definitely a, a sort of best practice there. 
Um, and this will, all this will not only reduce waste, but it will also redistribute resources to less privileged communities in a way that's you know, largely eco-friendly. Um, we can also mitigate our carbon footprint by, for instance, eating more meat-free meals and switching to a plant-based um, high-fiber diet, uh, buying organically and locally, uh, which reduces carbon emissions. Um, and also choosing eco-friendly commute options like public transport or carpooling, um, walking or riding a bike. Um, another idea that resonates with me is creating green spaces. So like rain gardens, community gardens and green roofs, um, and also helping to protect and conserve uh, pre-existing green spaces like local parks. Um, then if we uh, dive into the second sense of contributing to sustainability as a member of the community, um, we can voice any environmental concerns we have um, when we're speaking to the brands that we buy from because they tend to listen to consumer um, feedback and also to our elected representatives who will obviously care about what we think. Um, we should also be supporting communities disproportionately impacted by climate change um, and that may not have the same political visibility uh, where their concerns are taken seriously. So. Uh, in this situation, people with more privilege need to do uh, what they can to stand with people with less privilege. Um, and lastly, I think peer pressure is a very powerful tool. So, you know, we can encourage our friends to join in our environmental pursuits. Um, it's also essential in the sense to communicate and persuade effectively. Um, so we can do this by connecting climate to an issue that the person we're talking to cares about. Um, so connecting climate to issues of employment or religion or personal experiences can be very effective as a uh, persuasion tool. Thank you, Dwara. Great personal thoughts. Steve, what is it you think individuals could be doing to fight the climate change? Uh, thank you, Marcy, and thank you to everyone who has been giving their points. So, as I discussed in my presentation, the biggest problem when it comes to uh, the discussion about climate change is that most of the times we tend to make it seem like such a colossal problem that uh, that's so big that we can't really uh, um, that our individual solutions can't really match up or really come, uh, help when it comes to uh, combating the issue. But the, as as I discussed before, the 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 reality the reality is actually the contrary. The contrary. So I'd just like to reiterate what perhaps since Stokes had said, and he come up with three practical solutions, which all start with S. So we can just say the three S's, and the first S is social. We need to spread positive social norms in our communities that are also practical. And this is just basically like using solar panels or carpooling to work. Uh, the second is signals. We need to tailor signals that motivate feed feedback of our habits. And in the book, um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, James Clear basically talks about how sometimes we we do certain things and we don't even realize that we're doing them. So most of the times I think it's best for us to sit down and think about how many times we've carpooled or how many times um, we've eaten beef. Like this may seem like it's quite insignificant, but that's that's the thing. Like um, most of the times the really insignificant things when you pull them all together become really significant. And the last point is basically stories. So we need to focus on positive stories of people who are taking practical approaches to the issue. And I'd like to give a personal example as well. So one of my, my, one of my friends called Julie um, used to post um, hikes or places she's gone to. And I, I was really envious because I really wanted to get into hiking, but I didn't know how to get into it. But what she didn't tell us is that for every hike that we go to, you have to plant a tree as well. So this transformed me, a person who used to look at people who run at 6 a.m. like they're crazy to someone who's actually hiking every month. And it's just basically what Doa said, like this social pressure, but in a positive way. Um, if we just come together and come up with innovative ways and we uh, influence our friends positively to join into them, then that becomes a very significant um uh, solution or a very significant way in the climate justice um, struggle. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. That was a good one. So over to you, Bakili. What do you think individuals should be doing? Um, thank you so much, uh, Mercy. Um, I think my colleagues have covered the ground. They've covered excellent ground. And I think one of the themes which I picked up from, from what they've mentioned is how our individual actions do have an impact. So the smallest things. 
And I think with my own experience of, of being a student, I realized um, at the end of the year that I was using a lot of plastic. Um, each and every week I, I, I went shopping. There was a lot of plastic that I was, I was using. And it came to dawn to me later on that, hey, I checked on my cardboard, I realized there's a lot of plastic. So after I decided that, well, I think it would be great to get a, a reusable bag and actually make sure that I use it every time I, I, I go for, for grocery shopping instead of, of, of getting new plastic every time. So I think in essence is that there are so, much, so many individual actions that we can take as individuals to make sure that we do shift the status quo. I know sometimes it could be demotivating to say, well, it's the smallest actions, but I, I am a firm believer that the smallest actions that we can take can make a huge difference. And I think what is also important that was also mentioned is how we can engage communities in such discourse. And this is particularly important, um, you know, in, in low middle income countries, again, I would mention, because you, it's quite hard to talk about climate change to someone who is unemployed. It's quite hard to talk to, to, uh, to talk about climate change to someone who is living under the poverty line. So how do you make sure that all those conversations are intertwined so that people do engage and everyone does engage in, in, in the conversation? So I think it's, it's very much important, particularly to, 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 to make sure that young people are a part of, 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 of the conversations so that we do hold our leaders accountable. We do hold um, our, our governments uh, to, to account so that we make sure that when addressing climate change, we make sure that we address all the socioeconomic issues which, which intertwine. So I think in essence, there is individual action, but also there is action on how do we make sure that we engage people, we engage communities to make sure that everyone does realize that each and every action that we have or that we do has an impact in our everyday realities. Okay, thank you very much, Bakile. Haruna says many stakeholders in the context of climate change have said that individual action are enough to address this issue. Let us all change our mind and set to realize that climate change is real. It is growing, it is growing and requires urgent intervention. Individual actions can be adopted by everyone everywhere, as summarized in the four arrows, which are reuse, repair, recycle, and reduce. So thank you to everyone who has dropped contributions in the chat box. We'll not be able to read all, but I'm sure everybody is seeing those contributions. So in the nutshell, we all have a role to play in combating this climate change. Your personal habits, if we all, for example, can mind the way we use plastic bags, for example. Therefore, there is already a great change. So your little habits and my little habits contribute to the great effect of the climate. So the choices we make today is how, we live, is how our lives will be tomorrow. So I think while we are doing our daily lives, creating our green spaces, planting more trees, reducing our carbon emission, and reducing our meat consumption and so on, we should not forget to educate our community. That closest friend to you, that closest peer, when you tell someone about climate change, tell someone about what actions to take, you are helping to spread the message. And I'm sure it is going to go a long way to solve this problem, if not to ameliorate the problem. So to this end, we say thank you to the Tellerist Network. We say thank you to the Catherine Foundation. We say thank you to MasterCard Foundation and all the sponsors of this conference. We are grateful and we are happy we were picked for this conference. And we thank you all for contributing. Thank you all for making this conference a success and making our session beautiful. To this end, I'll ask that the last slide be put up. Thank you. 
Thank you all for the all participants who, are, who have been watching us and thank, thanks for the comments. Thank you once more to everyone who had attended this session with us. We've officially come to the close of our session and we are grateful to you all and to your contributions. Have a nice end of the day.